Hello friends, my name is JJ. And do you know much about Bill Clinton? He was president of the United States when I was first getting interested in politics as a teenager. But I feel like his presidency is increasingly forgotten about these days. I mean, everybody knows his name and he is still very much alive and doing stuff, but how much do you really know about what his eight years in office were like? So today, I thought I would give you a summary of those eight years, but in a creative sort of way. You see, for a long time, this American guy named Charles Brooks used to release an annual book like this one, and it would contain all of the best political cartoons, in his opinion, that had been published in newspapers that past year. And because I am a big fan of political cartoons, I happen to own all eight of the collections released during the Clinton years, and I have looked through them all and come up with the cartoons that I think summarize Clinton's presidency the best. Three from every year for 24 in all. So let's get started. But first, some quick background information on who Bill Clinton is. Born in 1946, Bill got into politics when he was quite young and was elected governor of his home state of Arkansas at just 32. In 1992, he ran for president as a Democrat, and despite being a fairly obscure politician to most of the country, he was very charming and charismatic and struck a lot of people as representing the kind of youthful vigor the country needed. When I got into this race for president, Mr. Bush was at 70% in the polls, and even my mother didn't think I could win. Ideologically, he was a proud centrist, someone who had a mix of both liberal and conservative beliefs, and in the context of the time, this was seen as a refreshing break from a political culture that was full of too many dogmatic figures of either the rigid right or rigid left. Defying expectations, in November of 1992, Governor Clinton defeated the incumbent Republican president, George H.W. Bush, ending 12 years of Republican rule, as well as taking both chambers of Congress for the Democrats. But because there was a very strong third party candidate in the presidential race, Ross Perot, Clinton wound up winning the election with the narrowest slice of the popular vote in decades, meaning he came to office with the awkward knowledge that most Americans had voted against him. On January 20th, 1993, Bill Clinton was officially inaugurated as the 42nd president of the United States. All right, let's get to the cartoons. On the campaign trail, Bill Clinton had made a big deal about the competence and political skill of his wife, Hillary Rodham Clinton, claiming she would be the most politically engaged first lady in American history. He once even quipped that electing him meant that voters would be getting two for the price of one. The idea of the president openly making use of his wife to help him run the country was controversial for various reasons. Some people saw it as unseemly and nepotistic, while a lot of Republicans resented it because they had more traditional beliefs about the appropriate role of a wife, and because Hillary was seen as being a lot more liberal than her husband. On all sides, however, it was not uncommon for people to suggest that Hillary was simply smarter than Bill, and that's what this first cartoon seems to be implying. We see Bill getting his presidential portrait done, but the artist is painting Hillary. A persistent inability for the president to assert his authority was a pretty consistent theme of the first year of Bill Clinton's presidency, however, which is also the theme of this next cartoon here. We have the president in some sort of boxing ring, and this guy is saying, slow down, you're running out of towels, Bill. And each towel is labeled with the name of some matter that Clinton basically gave up on during the first few months of his presidency. These ones here, Guineer, Baird, and Wood, are the names of three women that Clinton nominated to senior posts in the Justice Department only to then abruptly pull their nominations when various scandals about them came to light. These women were all popular with liberals, and the quickness with which the president abandoned them over fairly minor controversies was seen as a bit of a sellout of principle for the sake of politics. The same was true with this one, labeled gays. This refers to Clinton's campaign promise to end the US military's ban on gay soldiers, which was one of his more provocative ideas in that more homophobic age. Once in office, However, Clinton merely offered up a compromise reform. Officers could no longer ask soldiers if they were gay, but they could continue to fire soldiers who were openly gay. So the ban wasn't really repealed as much as made slightly harder to enforce, and for almost two subsequent decades, thousands of gay soldiers would continue to be kicked out of the US Armed Forces. Tax cuts refers to how on the campaign trail, Clinton had promised a middle-class tax cut, but once in office, he shifted his priority to cutting 
the American government's budget deficit. This was seen as one of the most pressing economic issues of the time. The first major piece of legislation that the Democratic Congress passed under Clinton, in fact, the Deficit Reduction Act of 1993, actually raised taxes on Americans making over 100 grand a year in order to generate new revenue to fight the deficit. And then this Haiti towel represents his flip-flop on Haitian refugee policy. Clinton had originally said that he was going to have a much more welcoming refugee policy to Haitians who were fleeing that country, which was undergoing a lot of political turmoil at the time. In office, however, he kept the policy of intercepting and turning back refugees that had been established by the previous Republican government. One big success that Clinton had in his first year in office, however, was appointing his first justice to the Supreme Court, the famous Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Though Ginsburg would eventually earn a reputation as one of the most famously progressive judges in American history, when Clinton nominated her, there wasn't that much curiosity about her or her beliefs, and the Senate confirmed her nearly unanimously because, in those days, Supreme Court appointments weren't seen as this big ideological battle the way they are now. In this cartoon, we have Ginsburg and Clinton and this big ferocious dinosaur labeled media. And Clinton says, it strikes only if you move, which is a reference to how in those days, Supreme Court nominees only got much attention from the press if they did anything particularly wild or unusual, which the very square and boring Ginsburg did not. So year two wasn't a great one for Clinton either. A number of personal scandals from his past, involving everything from shady business deals to allegations of sexual harassment, became subjects of formal investigations in 1994, and coverage of these investigations became a big fixation of the press. They helped give credence to a long-standing conservative accusation that the president was a fundamentally unethical guy. In this cartoon, we have Clinton as a Boy Scout leader in the woods, and the trees are labeled with all of his various personal scandals. And he's like, f***ing moral compass. And the kids representing his presidency are like, we're lost, aren't we, sir? 1994 also saw the defeat of another one of Clinton's most ambitious campaign promises, a thorough revamp of the US healthcare system in order to bring insurance coverage to the millions of Americans who lacked it. Hillary took the lead on this file, but it proved to be this hugely controversial undertaking with so many different groups in America all demanding their various concerns with the healthcare system be addressed, which of course were often conflicting. Negotiations with Congress over a comprehensive healthcare bill got bogged down for months, and in the summer of 1994, it was basically conceded that nothing was going to be passed. In this cartoon, we see a big guy labeled uninsured, and the nurse says to Dr. Clinton, He's still waiting, which is a commentary on how even though the politicians lost interest, the core issue remained unresolved. President Clinton's approval ratings were quite low by the end of 1994, which was unfortunate for him since that's when the first midterm congressional elections of his presidency took place. The Democrats lost control of both the House and the Senate, and a right-wing Republican congressman from Georgia named Newt Gingrich became the new Speaker of the House. This cartoon is called The Gingrich Who Stole Christmas. Christmas, and here we see Newt stealing political power, health care, and social spending in a big bag labeled the Great Society, which is a term that has been used to describe the suite of welfare programs that America established in the 1960s, and the sort of programs which the Gingrich-led Republican Party were promising to dramatically scale back. The early 1990s had seen the outbreak of a brutal civil war in the nation of Bosnia, with militia groups from that country's Christian Serbian minority, backed by the neighboring Republic of Serbia, engaging in terrible atrocities against Bosnia's Muslim majority. The Clinton administration had waffled for years over if and how the US should intervene, but in 1995, they took decisive action, negotiating a peace treaty between the Serbian and Muslim leaders, then deploying 20,000 U.S. troops to participate in an international force to keep the peace. There was a fair bit of criticism of Clinton choosing to send ground troops to this part of the world, particularly given his own personal background as a bit of a peacenik. In this cartoon, we see Clinton as a peacekeeper protesting the Vietnam War as a young man, and then Clinton as a peacekeeper in 
1995, sending troops overseas. 1995 was the first full year that Clinton had to share power with a hostile Republican Congress. While both parties were committed to getting the American government's budget deficit under control, the Republicans wanted far deeper cuts to social programs than Clinton was prepared to tolerate. So in December of 1995, no budget wound up being passed at all, and for 21 days, all non-essential government services had to be shut down until the two parties could negotiate a mutually agreeable budget, which they eventually did. In this cartoon, we see the gears of the US government grinding to a halt because of the mutual stubbornness of Clinton and the Republicans. Speaker Gingrich was by now widely regarded as one of the most powerful men in Washington, possibly even more powerful than the president himself. In this cartoon, we see Clinton meeting with Boris Yeltsin, who was president of Russia during the 1990s, and a man who was often seen as a weak and unstable leader leader of an increasingly chaotic country. And Clinton says, frankly, Boris, I'm not convinced you're in control of the situation. But then Clinton himself has a big wind-up key in his back labeled Newt. Clinton and the Republicans did have a number of issues where they found they could work together, however. A big one being welfare reform, given that scorn for Americans living cushy lives on welfare had become an increasingly popular topic of political rhetoric in the 1990s. In August of 1996, President Clinton accordingly signed the bipartisan Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, which basically just imposed a lot of new regulations on benefits for the unemployed, making them harder to get. In this cartoon, we've got Clinton as Peter Pan and the Republican Congress as Tinkerbell, and he's saying to this welfare family, here you go, remember now, think happy thoughts and you can fly, you can fly. So you can see that the cartoonist is perhaps a little skeptical that welfare reform was really a problem that needed to be solved. Broadly speaking, however, the 1990s were a good economic time for most Americans, with the years between 1990 and 2001 being the country's longest unbroken period of economic growth in nearly 150 years. Then, as now, it remains disputed how much credit the policies of the Clinton administration deserve for any of this, but the president himself was often happy to take credit, which we see parodied here. Sometimes it's hard to believe I'm responsible for all this. A consistently strong economy did a lot to push up Clinton's poll numbers, which was good news for him, because 1996 was a presidential election year and Clinton wanted a second term. The Republicans nominated as their candidate Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole, who I think history has more or less concluded was a fairly dull and uninspiring candidate. Clinton also once again leaned hard into his centrism in the 1996 race, adopting a mix of liberal and conservative rhetoric that seemed to play well with voters. Despite a shaky first term, he won his second term easily, though the Republicans continued to hold Congress. In this one, we got Dole in a little car stuck behind the giant Clinton truck, and the little warning sign says, CAUTION! This vehicle makes wide right and left turns. 1997 saw the emergence of a bunch of new Clinton scandals, including allegations that the president had engaged in illegal fundraising practices, including charging cash for access to the White House. Here we see the president prying his cat's socks off the bed in the Lincoln bedroom, which was a part of the White House Clinton was revealed to have let big donors to his party spend the night in, in exchange for donations, as you can see alluded to on this little box. And Clinton says, sorry socks, only fat cats are allowed in here. <laughs> a popular allegation of conservatives of that time was that the Justice Department was far too disinterested in investigating the various allegations being made against Clinton, and that Janet Reno, the woman that Clinton eventually got appointed as Attorney General in particular, was more interested in showing partisan loyalty to her president than upholding the law. In this one, we see Attorney General Reno as a wall protecting Clinton from attacks. And he says, hang tough, Miss Reno. They're bound to run out of bombshells soon. China continued to greatly liberalize its economy during the 1990s, leading many to believe it was on its way to formally abandon communism and become a democratic free market country, just like many of the nations of Eastern Europe had done. The Clinton administration was eager to deepen trade with this new China, and in 1997, he hosted the newly installed Chinese president Jiang Zemin at the White House. The budding bromance between these two leaders was controversial, however, 
because it was less than a decade after the notorious Tiananmen Square massacre of student protests, and there wasn't really much evidence that China was liberalizing on the human rights front. So here we have Clinton and President Jiang, eye to eye on trade, but down here. So 1998 was a very iconic year for the Clinton administration, and indeed the country, because that was the year that the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke. Okay, let me try to summarize this as briefly as I can. Back in 1994, the government appointed a prosecutor named Kenneth Starr, a former cabinet minister from the Bush administration, to investigate one of Clinton's personal finance scandals. Independently appointed special prosecutors had a lot of freedom in those days, and as the years went on, Kenneth Starr started digging into various other matters and eventually discovered that President Clinton had been secretly having an affair with a White House intern named Monica Lewinsky, which began during the government shutdown of 1995. Starr would eventually allege that Clinton had engaged in an elaborate and illegal conspiracy to cover up this affair, including by repeatedly lying under oath when he was forced to testify about his relationship with Ms. Lewinsky as part of an unrelated sexual harassment lawsuit with a different woman that he was also dealing with at the time. In the summer of 1998, Clinton ended months of denials and admitted that the affair had, in fact, happened. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. He maintained that he hadn't actually lied about anything, though, which was true only if you used the most weird and weaselly lawyer logic, which in turn became something very much associated with the president for the rest of his term. In this cartoon, for instance, we see Clinton depicted as the young George Washington having cut down the cherry tree, and his lawyer is saying, and furthermore, my client did not chop down this tree, only the ax made contact with the tree, not my client. This is clearly a hit and run smear campaign by the independent counsel. The Lewinsky scandal was probably the biggest story in the world for much of 1998, and I think even now is one of the main things that people remember about the Clinton presidency. Many cartoonists of the time saw that coming. Jefferson Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, Clinton Memorial. But despite how weird it was to hear all of this stuff about the president's sex life in the news, Clinton had actually become a pretty well-liked president by this time. His poll numbers actually went up during the scandal, including with women, which confused a lot of Republicans. In this one, we have all these angry conservatives over here, and this woman voter is like, like, simple, I stay with him for the sake of the kids. And we have Clinton playing with kids labeled schools, childcare, and health, suggesting that to a lot of voters, Clinton's progressive policies were more important than his personal life. Kenneth Starr recommended that the Republican Congress impeach Clinton for the Lewinsky scandal, and although the House of Representatives voted yes, the Senate voted no, and by quite a solid margin. A lot of Republicans seemed pretty surprised that Clinton was able to get away with it, as we see in this cartoon where Clinton is walking the impeachment plank. In other news, all of those years of economic growth, cutting government spending, and collecting more taxes from the rich finally paid off. In January of 1998, it was announced that for the first time in decades, the US government was actually pulling in more revenue than it was spending, with the government expected to run annual budget surplus of hundreds of billions of dollars for the next few years. The politicians immediately began dreaming up all sorts of new things to do with this money. Although, in this cartoon, you can see we have Mrs. America over here telling Clinton and the Republicans that maybe you should let it grow first. Over in Europe, Serbian forces continued to stage attacks against people of other ethnicities located in territories they believed to be theirs, this time against ethnic Albanians in the province of Kosovo. In the spring of 1999, the US bombed Serbia as part of an international NATO mission, which did get the Serbs to back off of Kosovo. But the notorious leader of the Serbs, Slobodan Milosevic, who was seen as responsible for much of the violence in that part of the world, was able to stay in power.
The final full year of the Bill Clinton presidency was dominated by the tight but boring 2000 presidential election between Clinton's drab vice president, Al Gore, and George W. Bush, the Texas governor and son of former President Bush. At the time, it was the conventional wisdom among political observers that President Clinton and his various scandals were a liability for the Gore campaign, and the vice president went out of his way to avoid spending too much time with him on on the campaign trail, as we see here, where we have Gore, and then his running mate, Senator Lieberman, who had been quite critical of Clinton, and then Bill is being shoved off way over here. The president himself, meanwhile, was often framed as a man who was desperate for a legacy as the clock was starting to run out. Though his eight years in office had been a time of peace and prosperity for America, as he was fond of saying, presidents only really tend to get remembered if they do something really big and flashy and important. In the summer of 2000, Clinton accordingly spent a great deal of time trying to negotiate a peace deal with the leaders of Israel and Palestine, but that fell through at the last minute, as we can see in this one. Al Gore eventually lost the 2000 presidential election to George W. Bush, dashing Clinton's hope of extending democratic control of the White House for another four years. But that same election also saw his wife Hillary get elected to the United States Senate, the first time in history a first lady had ever gotten elected to anything. From 2001 onward, the dynamic in America's most famous power couple accordingly shifted. Hillary was now the most politically important Clinton, while Bill was the supportive figure in the background. I think this cartoon provides a fitting bookend cookie. So there you have it, the Clinton presidency in 24 cartoons. Let me know your thoughts on Bill in the comments below, and if you would like to see me do this with some other president someday. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week.